Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. Did you listen to Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie this Thanksgiving? The Berkshires has its own collection of time-honored holiday traditions, and this song is one. And I don't mean the short version. I mean the entire 18-minute, 34-second version. It's actually called Alice's Restaurant Massacre. Perhaps after listening to the song, while mashing potatoes and finding space in the oven beside the turkey for the rolls, you also find time to watch the movie of the same name out of the corner of your eye. In this instance, the word massacre is being used in the traditional Ozark Mountain colloquial sense to mean an event so absurd as to be unbelievable. The song follows the tale of a true, though exaggerated, Thanksgiving Day adventure that unfolded in 1965 in the town of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Arlo and friends had gone to the home, which was once an old church, of Alice, the owner of Alice's Restaurant, though it wasn't called Alice's Restaurant. It was just that Alice owned it. It's all explained in the song. And Ray Brock, her husband. There, they partook in holiday festivities. But when the feasting was over, Arlo and a few others noticed that Brock hadn't been bringing the garbage to the dump. So, being grateful guests, they decided to pile the trash into a VW microbus and bring it to the town dump for them. Once they got to Stockbridge, however, they found the dump closed for the holiday. Befuddled and unwilling to bring the garbage back to the church and let down their hosts, they instead found a secluded hillside along the road and pitched the trash over the edge. Then they drove off. The problem was, other than littering, of course, that the police took notice and did a little rummaging through that trash. Within the pile, they found an envelope bearing the address of the church. The jig was up. Arlo and his friend Richard, or Rick, Robbins, a fellow folk singer, were both arrested. Thus, a whole new slew of unexpected events folded out before them. The movie based on the song came out in 1969. Over the years, Arlo updated the song here and there, but also over the years, the song has become a Berkshire tradition. And so too the church, where the fiasco began. The church, the beautiful old Trinity Church, has become the Guthrie Center. It's still used to bring people together, just as it did all those Thanksgivings ago and just as it was built to do. Every Wednesday at noon, it hosts a free community lunch for those in need. Also on Wednesdays, a free legal clinic. There's free yoga every Friday at 10, but only from June until September. There's also tutoring for any educational level. And the Hootenanny, which is a concert each Thursday night and it's all free. You can find out more by visiting the Guthrie Center's website. Now that Thanksgiving has come and gone, plans for the next holiday would come to the front. For some, the holidays begin when they visit an event called Stockbridge Main Street at Christmas, which takes place on the last days of November and the first days of December, depending on the calendar and weekends. Norman Rockwell painted a painting, as he had a habit of doing, which took him 11 years to complete. Eventually it was finished in 1967. This painting depicted Main Street in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, including the window of his very own studio, decorated for the holiday season. The painting, called Stockbridge Main Street at Christmas, shows a snowy New England day. Cars of the era are parked along the street, 
The mountains loom gently in the background. People walk along the sidewalk, possibly on the hunt for a good gift to give. Children play in a mostly quiet road. A car passes with an evergreen tree strapped to its roof, and the windows of the decorated buildings glow with a welcoming warmth. All but the windows of the stately Red Lion Inn, which stands dark and unadorned at the right. This is because the Red Lion Inn would close for the colder months for most of its existence, and so remained empty, even for the sake of Norman's painting. When the town of Stockbridge, the painting being of course an instant hit, decided to make the painting into a tradition, the Red Lion Inn had expanded its hours to year-round, and wasn't about to be left out. Just as the rest of the street decorated up, copying the trimmings depicted in the painting, the Red Lion Inn was free to choose whatever holiday decor it wanted. And now it's common to see a line of lighted trees standing atop its famous front porch like a crown. Now, each year, for almost 30 years past, the scene is recreated. Vintage cars parked along the street. People come from far and wide to step right into a Rockwell painting. A winter event that I always looked forward to as a child was driving around Park Square and noticing for the first time that season that the giant wreath had been hung on the side of the big brick bank. More than the huge Christmas tree in the park itself, this wreath delighted me. It hung over the center of the city like a halo. That's what marked the beginning of the holiday season for me. The tree lighting ceremony in Park Square, Pittsfield, has been a very long and well-loved tradition. There's usually some sort of entertainment, festive snacks, and people are asked to, in the spirit of the season, donate a little food to the food pantry. Each year, an impressive tree is selected from those donated options. The one chosen is carefully removed, transported, and erected in Park Square, where it's decked out in lights. With the earlier setting of the sun, and during the often discouragingly long winter nights, the tree serves as a cheerful spectacle, no matter one's religion. Pittsfield has long been the center of holiday shopping, and decorating downtown Pittsfield has been an important part of the holidays since the start. Lights were used as soon as someone had figured out how to put them one after another upon a wire, and garlands were draped across North Street to make the city festive. Shoppers donned their best, which shoppers always did anyway. Times were less casual for sure, and no one simply put on jeans to head downtown. Even in summer, on a Friday afternoon, people were wont to head to North Street to see and be seen, to cruise in their cars, meet friends, see a movie, grab a bite to eat, but always in their best outfits. But when holiday shopping was in order, people flocked in even greater numbers. With over a hundred shops crammed along North Street and its side streets, there were lots of options. But one place was on everyone's list, England Brothers Department Store. Offering six stories of shopping pleasure, it had become the jewel of shopping choices in Pittsfield. And the store made the most of the holiday rush. It began outside, the first floor was lined with large windows. Any other time of year, these would have been decorated with the latest fashions. But around the holidays, the window displays turned to fanciful themes to delight children. The outside of the six-story building would be strung with thousands of lights and illuminated letters, bells, Santas, and other holiday icons, depending on the year. In what little room was left outside, England Brothers even brought in live reindeer, and around it all they piped Christmas music. Inside, the music continued. Just as with most classic department stores, every level was a different department, and most children were most excited to head to the fourth floor. That's where the toy department was held, and where they could meet Santa Claus. He wasn't the only Santa on North Street, there were a few others, but he was the most popular. 
This Santa's helper's real name was William, or Bill, Piggott. Beginning in 1941, he worked every season as Santa. He started first at Newberry's department store, but then moved along to the more prestigious England Brothers. But that's not all. He even worked as Santa at the request of smaller events and charity functions. If he had any free time around the holidays left, one of the most distinctive things about him was the sweetness of his Irish accent. That was because Bill Piggott was born in Tullamore in the county of Offaly in Ireland on July 28, 1898. But his early life wasn't easy. The Irish Republican Army, or the IRA, was busy making things quite difficult and rather dangerous in some parts of the country. Just going about your daily tasks could sometimes turn harrowing. So, in 1929, at the age of 30, he hopped aboard a ship with his wife Margaret and their two sons, Joseph and Christopher, and came to America. In 1930, documents show them renting a house at 182 Pontusic Avenue. It was while living there that their first American-born daughter, Anne Patricia, came into the world. He supported his growing family by working at General Electric. In 1980, they rented a new home at 216 Wakona Street, and it was easy to see why. In addition to the three they already had, five more children had come along. Patrick, Margaret, William, Rose, James, and Alfonso's. By 1960, they lived at 35 Forest Place, close to GE. Working at GE is how he made his weekly wage, but most important to him was the little extra that came in, with the splendid role that delighted thousands of children, probably most of all his very own. What an honor to say that your father is Saint Nick. Each Christmas, for 35 years, he donned the red attire, so long, in fact, that the first children who'd sat on his lap and whispered into his ear what they most wished for, grew up, had children of their own, and brought them, too, to see him as Santa. William himself estimated that over the years that he had performed the sacred role, more than 100,000 children had sat in his lap, and to each he gave a gift to remember the event by. As the years went by, his children grew, and eventually had families of their own. He'd have 27 grandchildren, and, so far, 37 great-grandchildren. But as is the way, all good, or in this case, wonderful things, must come to an end. In 1977, his wife Margaret passed away. And just four years later, in 1981, William Piggott followed. But Santa, of course, is alive and well. And so, it only makes sense that in the hearts and vivid memories of 100,000 Berkshire children, so is Bill. This has been The Berkshires Gone By. Created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where I post an image pertaining to Berkshire history almost every day. You can also find episodes on YouTube and by visiting www.theberkshiresgoneby.com, where you'll find every episode we've ever made along with specific images pertaining to each topic. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening.